In this edition of Raman Academy, I would like to introduce you to the theory of Raman scattering uh, from the uh, classical electrodynamic argument, that is to say based on the vibrational modulation of the molecular polarizability. Now, I want to quickly add that, uh, of course, to understand the Raman spectra that we ultimately obtain uh, with the, the band structure that it has, as well as even accounting for the intensities of the Stokes and the anti-Stokes Raman scattering, that actually requires quantum mechanics. And so uh, you, you can't explain it by the classical theory. However, the classical theory does give us a very good introduction and explanation for uh, taking us a good way towards an understanding of Raman scattering. And so we'll, in an in a, in additional session, uh, cover the quantum mechanical explanation. All right, so from classical electrodynamic theory, what are the things that we're going to cover today? Well, an induced molecular dipole moment, first of all, that's generated uh, as a result of the interaction of the molecule with uh, an incident electromagnetic wave or light. What's important about that is that uh, that interaction of light in the molecule to produce a dipole moment generates an oscillating dipole moment which emits radiation or uh, light scattering as we're going to uh, as we're going to discuss. Now, what's the basis of that induced dipole moment? Well, it's the polarizability. And uh, in particular, with respect to the Raman effect, what is most important is the polarizability as a function of the nuclear coordinates or the vibrations of the molecule. Uh, we'll go beyond that to get a mathematical and a graphical understanding or sense of the polarizability ellipsoid and how that's associated with the chemical bonds and the vibrational motions and from dealing with those ellipsoids get a, um, a sense of how certain vibrational modes can be Raman active or Raman inactive. All right let's begin with the most basic expression uh, in dealing with uh, light scattering and electrodynamics of the interaction of a molecule with light and that's P, the induced dipole moment which is the product of alpha, the polarizability tensor, times E, the incident electric field. Now molecular polarizability what actually is that? There are a lot of people who may not be entirely familiar with, uh, with that concept. It is the ease with which the electron density distribution uh, of the molecule through the bonds can be distorted by an electric field. Now, the reason that I've got these additional symbols above the letters P, alpha, and E is the fact that, and it's an important one, that the induced dipole moment is a vector, right? You see the various components x, y, and z right here. The incident electric field is a vector, and alpha, the polarizability, is a tensor, and it's a second rank tensor, uh, specifically a 3 by 3 tensor covering x, y, and z axes and we're going to get into that to some detail to be able to then understand uh, this polarizability in three dimensions. Now an oscillating electric field uh, just from classical electrodynamics we know induces an oscillating molecular dipole moment so that in our previous expression where we had P is equal to alpha times E, well now we have to take into account the fact that that incident electric field from the electromagnetic radiation is an oscillating electric field at a frequency nu of that uh, that incident light. And here uh, 
in Raman scattering, we're, we're generally talking about visible light, uh, also, of course, UV, uh, near infrared. But the point is, is that, that incident radiation is at a much higher energy, much higher frequency, uh, and we'll see why that's important, of the vibrational, the frequencies of the vibrational motions of the molecules. So that if we now incorporate this uh, sinusoidally varying electric field, then our expression for the dipole moment, for the static uh, dipole moment is uh, the following. Alpha e sub zero times cosine the quantity two pi nu t. All right, now let's consider this a molecule and a laser incident upon that molecule. And since we're talking about lasers here, let's think of this as monochromatic radiation and it's polarized. And so as it continually interacts with our molecule, it's continually inducing a dipole moment at the frequency of that incident radiation. And so this oscillating dipole moment then uh, emits radiation, as we know from classical electrodynamic theory. All right, and so the scattering occurs in, uh, in different directions. It's indicated here, backscattering or right angle scattering. Now the polarizability of the molecule uh, can be described as a Taylor expansion that includes this, the static polarizability as we've thus far been discussing it, in addition to a component taking into account small vibrational displacements. And so that would be the, the derivative of, of polarizability with respect to Q. And so we've got the static or equilibrium polarizability. This would be the polarizability that you would consider for a molecule that's uh, not in motion or let's say at the equilibrium position with respect to the vibrational motion. And then here is our vibrational modulation or molecular polarizability with respect to Q as I've said and Q is uh, the letter that we'll use to describe a normal vibrational coordinate. So we're, we're varying the polarizability as a function of uh, the vibrational coordinate or the motions of the atoms within the molecule. Now, as we've just written it, that derivative of polarizability with respect to Q times Q is going to vary sinusoidally uh, by a frequency associated with that vibration. So now the Q value here uh, can be expressed as follows with Q naught where Q naught is basically the maximum value of Q times cosine uh, 2 pi times the frequency of the vibration of the molecule times the time. So when we put all that together then our Taylor expansion thus far limited to the static linear polarizability and the vibrational modulation gives us these two components. Now incorporating the polarizability from the static and the vibrational components into our original expression for the induced dipole moment, we see that there is a term for the uh, induced dipole moment and therefore scattering that will occur at the frequency of the incident radiation and then we have this component here uh, for, uh, which combines the incident radiation frequency with the vibrational frequency of the, uh, of the molecule and the vibrational modulation of the polarizability. Okay? Now using a trigonometric identity uh, which is basically the cosine of an angle times a second angle uh, is equal to one half this quantity here. We can now apply this trigonometric identity uh, to 
the expression up here where we have these two cosine functions. And when we do that, what we end up with for the full expression for light scattering from oscillating molecular dipole moments is uh, this static value for the Rayleigh scattering. And now you see we've separated our components here and we have the Stokes Raman scattering component. The Stokes meaning uh, scattering occurring at a frequency with an energy difference associated with the, uh, the difference between the incident frequency and that of the vibration. And then the anti-Stokes Raman scattering which is the additive component. Now, here is a graphical representation of the mathematical expression that we saw on the previous slide. So what are we considering here? Well, let's for the moment just think about uh, a diatomic molecule where the plus signs correspond to the nuclei in this diatomic molecule and then of course there's a chemical bond between them and there's the result of this molecule interacting with the incident electric field of, uh, of our light we basically get an induced dipole moment and that's the induced dipole moment at the frequency of the incident light but now we're going to add to that component the vibrational modulation so here we can think about uh, this bond being stretched, contracted, and stretched again. So now what we're doing is we're superimposing upon that, um, upon that function of the frequency of the incident light an additional component associated with the vibration, which is at, uh, as you can see, a much lower frequency. And now, as we saw in the, uh, in the previous expression, we can separate those components into first the Rayleigh scattering, which is the light scattering at the same frequency as the incident light, so that's elastic scattering, and there's no change in the frequency of that light, and the Raman scattering uh, components. So if you have more than just a diatomic molecule, uh, but you have three, four, n number of atoms bound together to form the molecule, then you'll have all these additional Raman components that you see in here. All right, now let's go back to the polarizability tensor and begin to consider a very important aspect of it, which is its symmetry. And the polarizability tensor, it's important to know, is symmetric. That is to say, the off-diagonal elements are reduced uh, or are equivalent. Let's put it that way. The xy is equal to the yx. All right. So these two values will necessarily be equivalent to each other. The yz and the zy. Okay. These two values, and xz and zx. So what that means then is we can reduce the total number of values of uh, this nine component tensor to six. Uh, and one of the interesting things about a symmetric tensor is that it can be transformed to a new coordinate system. So it's basically just a mathematical transform that allows you to go from the x, y, and z coordinate system to a new coordinate system which we'll call x prime, y prime, and z prime such that in this new coordinate system only the diagonal elements, these are the diagonal elements, are non-zero. And it is in this coordinate system that we are then able to graphically represent the polarizability ellipsoid. Okay, so here's Here's the original polarizability tensor, and then we're going to transform that to a different coordinate system, and then represent that graphically. 
and mathematically. Now conventionally uh, the description for the Raman polarizability is the one given here in which we're using uh, reciprocal values of the square root of the polarizability and that quantity squared in the denominators. All right, So you may recognize the x squared, y squared, z squared equals 1 and if all those values were equal then you have a sphere. Right? Uh, where they are not equal then that's where you get the ellipsoid from. Now these three components in the denominator, they the reciprocals constitute the lengths of the polariz polarizability ellipsoid semi-axes. All right, so these reciprocals, reciprocal values of the polarizability, are essentially the lengths of the axes. This is important to remember. Uh, if we look at a polarizability ellipsoid, then, and here we've sort of have a generic one shown on our x prime, y prime, z prime axis, then if we invoke our expression, then our maximum values at the extrema along the uh, axes will be equal to the reciprocal of the square root of the polarizability. So the important point to understand here is that the larger the value of alpha, that is to say the larger the value of the polarizability, the smaller the length of the polarizability axis. Okay, So what that means then is for a more polarizable ellipsoid, this value will become shorter and shorter. So in other words, the smaller the ellipsoid, the more highly polarizable it is. The longer it is along a particular axis, the less polarizable it is. So in this particular case, what we would say then is that polarizability along the x prime and the y prime axes are greater than the polarizability along the z axis. Why? Because these reciprocal values are shorter. All right. Now you can always of course go back, since you're watching this in video, you can always go back to that if you need to think about that more, have that sink in, and I, I encourage you to do so. Uh, so now let's take a look at some polarizability ellipsoids of some small, vol small molecules and their, uh, and their vibrations. Now let's, let's just consider for the moment here uh, two old favorites, carbon dioxide and water. So the first uh, or new one vibration, that's how it's designated, uh, the symmetric stretch of CO2 is depicted here and what you'll see in the center, the, the, the center value is in general the equilibrium or let's call it, yeah let's call it the equilibrium value or the zero displacement value for the ellipsoid. Okay? And now as the bonds stretch you see that the ellipsoid gets smaller in the symmetric stretch which is to say it becomes more the molecule is becoming more polarizable and then when the bonds contract the molecule becomes less polarizable which is to say this ellipsoid becomes larger. So in, these vi uh, in this symmetric stretch vibration of the CO2, what you're seeing is this change in the size of the polarizability ellipsoid. Now you see that also in the anti-symmetric stretch of CO2, but what's different from the symmetric stretch, and we'll get to this a little later and we'll see the importance of this, is that the dimensions of these ellipsoids appear to be approximately the same uh, for each of these uh, extrema for the uh, for the vibrational motion. Now this is for a linear molecule, CO2. Now if we look at water, H2O, uh, the new 2 mode is a scissoring mode or an angle bending mode and now what you see is something a little different from 
what we first saw up here. Now we're seeing a change in the uh, a change in the polarizability ellipsoid with respect to both size and shape. And then finally with the anti-symmetric stretch of H2O, different because it's not linear like CO2, but a bent molecule, now what we see is essentially a change in the orientation of the polarizability ellipsoid as a function of the uh, as a function of the vibration or the uh, normal co vibrational coordinate. All right, uh, two points that I'd like to make here about the polarization of the induced dipole moment light scattering that I'd like you to keep in mind, uh, which are very important and relate to the tensors. And, and specifically the diagonal elements of the tensor, meaning like the xx, the yy, and the zz, and the off-diagonal elements. If you have an isotropic molecule, in, just in general, then as, as we think about, for example, the, the static polarizability, then the scattered radiation is going to have the same polarization as that of the incident polarization or at least that along those diagonal uh, diagonal elements okay because of the isotropy of that molecule and the induced dipole moment now if you have an anisotropic molecule that means that the induced dipole moment can be along an axis that is different from the incident polarization and that's kind of what's indicated here. And so that means when the light is then emitted or scattered as a result of this oscillating dipole moment, well, it can have uh, cross polarization components. And so the important point to understand here is that the polarization of the induced dipole moment need not be parallel to that of the incident radiation for anisotropic molecules. And that's where you start getting into things like measurements of the depolar, depolarization ratios and so forth. That is to say, measuring Raman scattering both parallel and perpendicular. All right, now let's take what we learned about the polarizability ellipsoid and start applying it to these vibrational modes. And what you see here are the three vibrational modes You've got 3n minus 6 uh, modes, vibrational modes, of water. And so you've got a symmetric stretch in the upper left-hand corner, an anti-symmetric stretch in the upper right-hand corner. You'll note that sometimes you'll see the term asymmetric. That's actually, the appropriate term is anti-symmetric, but it's over the years the anti would sometimes be shortened in the nomenclature with just a symmetric, but it's really supposed to be anti-symmetric. Uh, just a, a fine point if, if you're interested in that. And then in the lower left-hand corner is a bending mode. So you have all three of these motions. And then in the lower right-hand corner is the superposition of those three uh, vibrational motions. Now let's separate them and analyze each one of these vibrational motions, each associated with its own polarizability ellipsoid for the specific vibrational modes. And let's see what that means for the Raman activity. That is, say, whether the mode is Raman active or inactive. All right, so our first uh, vibrational mode, the new one symmetric stretching mode, what we see is that in the symmetric stretch, what we see is a change in the polarizability sphere or ellipsoid. This is actually kind of a sphere, it looks like. And the important point here is that this modulation of the polarizability around this equilibrium position is not equal to zero. That is to say, you see these the size 
the polarizability ellipsoid changing and they're different on either side of this vibrational coordinate. So the thing to notice here is that the, in this particular case what's most important is that the size of the ellipsoid uh, has, uh, has changed and as a result because this is a non-zero value that means uh, this will be a Raman active mode. Now the bending mode that we were just looking at in the previous slide what we see here in the bending mode is that both the size and the shape but let's particularly focus on the shape we see that the shape is changing so on either side of the equilibrium position we see quite different shapes of the polarizability ellipsoid and so therefore on either side of this coordinate we have strikingly different values and so therefore the derivative is going to be a non-zero value and that makes it Raman active. And then for the last mode in which the anti-symmetric stretching mode what we see is a change in the orientations of these polarizability ellipsoids in conjunction with uh, the anti-symmetric stretch so that too is going to be a Raman active mode and so in just this one molecule uh, I hope what you can see here is that the three aspects of changes to the polarizability ellipsoid contribute to whether or not a Raman mode is going to be active that is to say the size the shape or the or orientation of the Raman uh, polarizability ellipsoid. Now a comment about whether something is uh, Raman active and the strength of the bands. This is very important. The Raman scattering strength depends on the magnitude of the Raman polarizability tensor. Okay, So whether a Raman mode is active or inactive is determined by whether this value is zero or non-zero. So the allowedness of a mode is, is strictly dictated by that. But the magnitude or the intensity is going to be proportional to the dot product of the incident polarization times the polarizability tensor times the collection polarization or the orientation at which the light is being collected. So if this value of the polarizability is low then you can have a Raman active mode but it's going to yield a weak or a strong band depending on the magnitudes of the value of the non-zero tensor elements. All right. Now let's look at the interesting case of carbon dioxide which is a linear molecule and if uh, you remember from your uh, any instruction you've had on vibrational spectroscopy with a linear molecule you have 3n minus 5 uh, so that gives us four vibrational modes but here we're only showing three well why is that well in the previous uh, motions from H2O what you would have might have noticed is that in the bending mode it was strictly in one direction now let me back up a moment if you look at the symmetric stretch and the anti-symmetric stretch they're clearly taking place along the uh, along the molecular axis but if you look at the bending mode it almost looks like it's rotating like the uh, the carbon atom is rotating about the center and that's because what you're seeing there is the combination of two what are called degenerate vibrational modes so there are two modes plus the symmetric plus the anti-symmetric to constitute the four modes so you have two bending modes that are orthogonal to each other and uh, when they're both operating together and they're degenerate it looks kind of like a rotating carbon in the center and then finally in the lower right hand corner you see the, the superposition of all of these of all of these modes now let's 
look at in a little more detail in the essentially the changes in the polarizability or the modulation of the carbon dioxide polarizability as a function of Q, the normal coordinates for the vibration. If we consider the case of the of new one, the symmetric stretch, what we see is that on either case uh, of, uh, at uh, expansion and contraction of that bond, what we're seeing is that the slope in going through the equilibrium position is non-zero. And that is essentially is our, our partial derivative of the polarizability with respect to Q. So this new one symmetric stretch should be Raman active. That's what we would expect. Now what's interesting is that for both the new two bending modes, remember there are two degenerate modes here, and the new three anti-symmetric stretch, what's interesting is that for those polarizability ellipsoids on either side, we're basically seeing the same values. So for very small displacements, about the equilibrium position, what that really means then is that we've got a slope equal to about zero. And so our expectation would be that uh, they would not in fact be Raman active. So let's take a look at this. Here are the polarizability ellipsoids of the carbon dioxide vibrational modes. And we see the size is changing and from our previous plot the uh, the derivative is not equal to zero and so this is a Raman active mode and I pointed this out earlier and hopefully now this graphically looks consistent with the uh, with the plots that I showed you on the previous slide where you see on either side of this equilibrium coordinate you've basically got the same kind of size and shape of the polarizability tensor. So in this particular case then, right about that equilibrium position, the, the derivative is equal to zero. So our expectation would be that it is Raman inactive. And that's for both degenerate, both of the degenerate bending modes. And then finally, our anti-symmetric stretch. You see that, again, on either side of the equilibrium position, the shapes and the size are the same. And so our expectation, and in fact, what we know from experiment is that nu3, uh, the anti-symmetric stretch, is in fact Raman inactive. So let's just uh, recap then on what it is that uh, we've covered today in this introduction to the Raman effect or Raman scattering through classical electrodynamic theory. We talked about the induced molecular dipole moment, which is at the very heart of light scattering, both elastic light scattering and uh, Raman scattering. And that is because an oscillating dipole emits radiation and then the polarizability, very important. Polarizability we saw was a function of not just the equilibrium position or the static polarizability, but also uh, in a Taylor expansion of the nuclear coordinates. And it is from that uh, vibrational modulation of the polarizability in, of, as a function of the nuclear coordinates that the Raman effect occurs. We then saw the uh, graphically how that can be understood through the polarizability ellipsoid. And by looking at the changes to the polarizability ellipsoid, and specifically the size, the shape, and the orientation of the ellipsoids, if you do not have substantial changes about the equilibrium position for the vibrational coordinate, uh, then that vibrational mode will not be Raman active. Conversely, if the polarizability uh, 
size, shape, or orientation does change about that coordinate and changes in an anti-symmetric fashion, shall we say, uh, then that mode will be Raman active. Well, thank you for your uh, interest and uh, be watching for an additional uh, segment in which we'll go through an explanation of Raman spectroscopy from the quantum mechanical perspective.